Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Best Ever You show. We have an evening with Michael McGlone, actor Michael McGlone, writer Michael McGlone, musician Michael McGlone. You're all, you're all things and more. And um, I'm so proud and honored to call you a friend for a really long time now. And welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. I've been looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm, I'm like right off the back line. I wonder if he's going to do like impressions or... I'd be happy to, sure. If we find our way to segue into some oh. some Christopher Walken yes. is always advisable in an interview, where especially when you, you you're talking with a lovely lady like yourself, because it's it's enjoyable to know that Christopher respects you and admires you very much too. That's so much fun. I don't know how people do that. But did you have you been that way since you were a little kid? Like I, from the time I was a little kid, have desired a great deal of attention. So that would be a yes. Wherever I could get attention, however I could get attention, I was relatively in the market for that. And as that led to the discovery of certain abilities that I had, whether it's to perform in a more general way or do an impersonation of someone or write a poem, et cetera. Though so all of the things that I do are attached to wanting to share myself with other people and, and to be acknowledged for certain gifts that I've been given. Yeah, which are many. What, of, of Thank all, you. Oh my gosh, yeah. Of, of all the things that you've done, do you have a favorite? Like you're, I mean, you're so well known for like the Fitzgerald family Christmas. She's the one. I mean, there, there are so many of them. Thank you. I, are you talking about films or? Anything. Any I, project. I would say that it's, it's very difficult. And I would even say impossible to say there's a favorite because there have been so many that are so special for a variety of reasons. So they equal each other in for different reasons. Though I would, to not leave you without an answer entirely, say that the shooting of the Brothers McMullen, which was my first film that I was not paid for initially, that I got through the paper without an agent, which turned out to be a Sundance Grand Jury Prize winner and created a career for several members of the cast, was and is probably the most magical project for many reasons, though some that are attached to the way I just described the film. Nobody knew what was gonna happen with it. We were all doing it for love and it was something that while it was happening, I felt a, an unaccountable sensation of possibility. I didn't know what the possibility was, but it was there's something special happening here and, and this this could possibly be something. Someone else I think might recognize how special this is too. Because it just felt so much that way. And I think that has to do with the fact that it was this divine blessing and that was a part of the vibration of making it. Yeah. You know yeah, I agree. I love that movie. Um, Thank you. You're such a you're such a nice guy in person, and sometimes the characters you play, I'm like, where does that come from, Michael? <laughs> oh my goodness, I love that you're interested in knowing more about that because I love being loving. I love showing other people love, and I love human decency expressed by myself and other people. I love manners. I love us all relating to each other in ways that are fundamentally based in love and respect, because I believe that's how we evolve further. And it is at the core of my belief system and the core of what I think is important about how we treat each other. That having been said, because I meditate on it so intensely and I want to be so fundamentally right in that way, when I can play a character who doesn't have that same restriction, who doesn't, and I, I, I hesitate to call it a restriction, that same code of conduct, I am relieved. And I can just, that I can just let all of the 
other nastiness that exists for all of us. No matter how right and true you want to be, you're a human being. And that means you comprise a lot of different ugly things as well as beautiful things. And so when you can let all that out in a healthy way, it's really therapeutic and really wonderful. And it's indispensable also for artists because we want to be all things. We want to express the serial killer and also the good Samaritan. At least I do. And I think most artists probably associate with that yeah. too. Is it is it hard to have a career that spans decades? I don't know. I, I, mean, I don't identify my life with difficulty, even though I'm in various fields that are defined in a lot of people's minds by being very difficult. I, I don't see it as that. And I, I strive actually to not give in to the temptation to see it as that, because that is a temptation because there are challenges inherently in being an artist, though there are challenges inherently in doing anything dynamically in doing anything that's worthwhile. Loving other human beings can be a titanic challenge. So anything that is worthwhile, you're going to have those challenges. And I came to an agreement with myself some time ago that I was going to make it my intention to be done with considering things difficult or easy. I was either going to look at it that it needs to be done to have the best life that I can possibly have, or it doesn't need to be done. But it's it, it's a it, it's a That's it's cool. an unnecessary delineation to call it difficult or easy. Either you're going to do it because you have to do it to have the best life you're 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 entitled to, or you don't have to do it. Those are the two categories for me now. That's that's good advice right there. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. So what do you? Where's um? I mean, I'm bouncing all over the place with this and that. Please, I, I love a desultory conversation. Yeah. But when I'm talking to you, what I'm thinking of is gratitude because I, I love gratitude. And I, I, I'm curious what your take on gratitude is, because it seems like it's it's huge. You are very insightful, as I already knew. And that's another example of it. Gratitude is fundamental to my life. I believe that gratitude is fundamental to any loving experience, because if you're going to be positive, you are going to be grateful. They're 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 in constant relationship to each other. If you're feeling positive, you're gonna be feeling grateful. And if you're feeling grateful, you're gonna be feeling positive. This is how it works. And if you approach life with an, a fundamental belief that being grateful for everything that's coming to you, whether you perceive it as positive or negative, is fundamental to the best life you can have, you're going to have, I think, a higher experience. And I really don't even believe in things being polarly negative. I, I think that our experience is constantly forward. I think our experience is constantly positive and it's only our viewpoint that makes it appear to be negative. And I'm even talking about disastrous things like tragedies, etc. There are so many examples throughout our history of things that would seem to be disasters that actually were these inherent experiences to an entire experience of greatness. Mm -hmm. And whatever's coming at me, I always want it to be engaged in the most positive way so that I can be the greatest instrument of love that I can possibly be. And I haven't found that it's ever possible for me to be the greatest instrument of love that I can be if I'm focused on something being negative or I'm concluding that it's negative because that holds me back and that narrows my experience. But if it's positive, it's open to all kinds of helpful questions about, okay, this seems like it's, it's powerfully negative. But that's not true in my belief system. So how is this going to assist me? How is this going to assist other people? How can I move through this gracefully and with love? Love it. Well, well said again. So Thank you. you. You moved from New York to Los Angeles. I did. Um, what, what's that like? Why would you do that? Um, all that good stuff. I lived in New York for many years, very, very happily. And I love New York still. And it will always remain a home to me. As the 
months approaching my move were illustrating to me, New York had become a place that was less desirable as a home than Los Angeles. Over the years, when I would come out to Los Angeles for trips that were a month and a half long, two months, some shorter duration, trying to drum up work or just decompress or both, I found that the happiness with which I inhabited Los Angeles was growing exponentially. And the and I won't say that I was ever unhappy in New York, but I wasn't as relaxed or tranquil or as joyful toward the end of my tenure in New York as I was when I would visit Los Angeles. And so that continued to be a part of my thinking and in my thoughts. And I found there was a lot of resistance in me to making the move because I had been so identified with New York for so long. And I identified with New York, I identified myself with New York for so long that I, I thought if I moved to Los Angeles, am I failing as a New Yorker? Am I, am I letting people down? Am I letting myself down? Am I giving up? There are all these things that were ego based. Really, they weren't truthful because the truth was you're feeling greater joy when you're in Los Angeles. That means something and you should, you should pay attention to that. But there were all these relatively ego based thoughts that were holding me back from pulling the trigger. Finally, I put my house on the market. I needed a push that, that my thoughts weren't necessarily giving me. So I said, you're going to put your house on the market for more than the market value is dictating right now. And if you get the price, that's the universe telling you, you have no choice. You're going to Los Angeles. You're going to accept that and do it. And I, I did. I sold the house for above its market value. That's awesome. Condo, actually, it was a, it was a, a two bedroom apartment. So when I say house, that's relative. Whatever, yeah. Yeah. And I, I noticed when you moved, you um, did all these cool things. I, I want to say boxing. I might be really wrong. Or, or I, I've trained in boxing. I, I I haven't had any professional career in boxing, though I have trained in it, and it's still something that exists as a a, a great thought process and, and, and guider for me because physically it, it taught me so much. One of the things it taught me was that a lot of that movement existed somehow, I think genetically already in my body. My paternal grandfather was drawn to boxing and he was a, a boxer uh, at, I believe an amateur approaching professional level. And he, I believe gave me a certain amount of ability in that field. So when I started training, I realized, oh, you really feel good doing this. And some people who know what it is to be a boxer had even acknowledged that, yeah, you do have some natural ability here. And it's something that I don't do every day, though. It's something that whenever I do engage in it, I'm always feeling very, very positive about it. And I'll take a run, for instance. And then after the run, if it's outside, I'll spend some time just shadow boxing, walking, et cetera. And jump rope became a, a larger part of my training regimen on and off because of boxing. And it's a great, great way to train. And my mom, who is 81 years old, also now trains in boxing twice a week. That's awesome. This is what a warrior this woman is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw that. I saw a post somewhere you were talking about your mom. And I was like, oh, that is so adorable. Yeah, you love your mama, don't you? Oh my goodness. She, she is and your family. a bedrock to my happiness and, and gratitude. I, there are times when I think about my mom in the course of my day and I have an almost breathless awakening of the gratitude that I feel for her friendship and her guidance. Her presence in my life is, is greater than I can articulate in words. It's very sweet. Yeah, I'm a mom of four boys. I think you know that. They're I do years. know that you and I, I and I, I know that you're a great mom too. And someday. <laughs> That's awesome. And what's that? I said I hope they say something like that about me if I get I'll bet them. they already do, Elizabeth. I'll bet they already do. I, I'll tell you that from my experience with my mom, when I was younger, I took her for granted. I know I took her for granted. And I assessed that later in my life. As I was approaching my 20s, 
I remember feeling that I hadn't appreciated my mom as substantially as was deserved. This was the feeling that I had. And I felt very, very moved to get to know her better and to acknowledge her more. And I did. And it's been such an enormous blessing. So if my experience is anything like your son's, and I'm not assuming that they're taking you for granted, though I would, if there's, if there's anything similar to them having a less profound experience as they're younger to when they're older, then I would say you have something very special to look forward to. But I, I, I don't want to assume anything. And I, 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 I look at pictures of you with your boys and it, it looks like they acknowledge their great mom. So cool. I'm very happy to see that. They're super great kids. Yeah. But um, they, the oldest one just moved out and he's like, mom, can I take your books with me? I'm like, Oh my God. <laughs> see, there's a good example of what I'm talking about. So he's already acknowledging how important you are to him and how important your spirit is to his life. Yeah. Super cute. Yeah. I, I love all those guys. They're, but I, yeah, I saw you with your mom and I'm like that. He's just got the best. And the mother son relationship is unique. There's something very special about that. I think I think parental opposite sex relationships have a capacity to be extremely powerful. All familiar relationships do. There is something to be said, I think, for opposite sex parental child relationships that are great teachers. Yeah. Because when I look at my mom as a woman and then as a human being beyond that, there's something about my understanding of a woman and my understanding of what it is to be a man and my understanding of what it is to be an integrated human being incorporating both man and woman inside myself that I don't think is possible in any other relationship for me. So it's a, it's a very, it's a very blessed relationship for many reasons. And that's one of them. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Okay. I don't have a producer in my ear, so I do have to look down at my notes a little bit. <laughs> sure. Whatever you need to do. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about what you're doing like right now. Um, I think people have seen you on CBS and um, playing detective. Uh, what's his name again? Shemansky. Detective Shemansky. And my, my Polish paternal grandmother would have been very pleased by that. And from uh, her 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 destination now. I'm sure she was to see that I was playing a a Polish cop on person of interest. I recently returned to CBS on SWAT, where I was playing near the polar opposite of Detective Shemansky. I was playing a a mad bomber, oh, nice. criminal murderer who was a a mercenary for hire blowing things up in Los Angeles and killing people in the process, which was equally gratifying to playing Detective Shemansky for oh, reasons yeah. that I hearkened to in my earlier answer, that when you get to play these wild, crazy, morally uninhibited guys, it's just fabulous. And I got to showcase long hair. I had long hair and they wanted me to keep the long hair so it was wonderful to have that on screen too. When, you, when they and, do that, do you, do you have to like walk around for days with that hair, or do they, do, or do, or do you go on set? It, it, it wasn't necessary that they put extensions on. I came to it with long hair, though I didn't think they would want it because this guy had an Italian mafia background, and he was from back east, Boston Italian mafia. So I thought for sure they'd want this guy to have shorter hair because that's how I saw the character. So I actually put my long hair in a ponytail for the audition and auditioned in a way that was advantageous to them not necessarily seeing the ponytail. Though after I got the job and I consulted with the producers about what do you want me to do? I, I need to know if we're cutting the hair or what you want me to do with it, how you want me to style it. And they said, keep it. So I did. Yeah. An unexpected, an unexpected bonus. Though then, for reasons of my own and also professionally, I wanted to cut it again. So that's why you're looking at it this way today. Yeah. Do you ever laugh at yourself? Just incredibly, like, do you have do you have a sense of humor about yourself? Ever? Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's so healthy to have that. I find that when I have a sense of humor about myself, it's a good sign that I'm in a good place mentally and emotionally. When 
you're more rigid and you can't laugh at yourself, it is a sign that something's going on that you need to think about and you need to focus on and get free of. There is something though that I have had to identify in the past and I identify now as well about when jokes are actually problematic, when they're not necessarily an invitation to engage in laughter at yourself, but they're mean spirited or they're, they're, they have a sarcastic quality that has a belittlement right. inherent to them. That type of thing is, I feel equally unhealthy and I don't embrace that. But when I know that it's coming from a healthy place and it's a joke at my expense, I love it. Like Don Rickles, he's a great example of healthy, of healthy teasing humor. And some people would say the teasing with him is a euphemism because he could really go after people, but he went after people and you didn't ever feel that it was mean spirited. You only ever felt that he had a great heart and he wanted to have fun and he wanted us all to laugh about ourselves, which is so healthy. So it's a, it's a gateway to joy. I find if you can laugh at yourself. You know who I, I love George Burns, like do, uh, of those types of people, like who do you classic? Do you know? uh, well, Don Rickles is a classic Johnny Carson. I uh, Jack, someone just reminded me of Jackie Gleason and his greatness oh. the other day. Uh, they called him the great one for obvious reasons. Carol O'Connor is one of the great comedic actors of all time. His timing in All in the Family, his comedic timing, his dramatic timing, as an actor, he is one of the great teachers of all time for me. And All in the Family is one of the great teachers in terms of television, because I also write in that medium. And... What Norman Lear did with that show, what Archie Bunker, what the whole cast did with that show. It's it's so brilliant. And I would love to know that it could still be appreciated today, because if it could be appreciated today, large scale, that means that people aren't so sensitive about their PC restrictions that they can see what you're talking about and what I'm talking about with laughing at yourself, where in All in the Family, you are looking at a stone cold bigot a lot of the time and you're laughing at him. And you're also laughing at the fact that this is a human capacity that we all have to acknowledge in order to get past it, yeah. because that's what the show was about. The show wasn't about bigotry. It was about getting past bigotry. But they used a bigot to show how absurd it is and how funny it is at times. And so I find that if people can engage in large scale examinations of what it is to be a human being, both negative and positive, and laugh at it and engage it with laughter, we're going to experience greater health as a community, as a world community. Yeah. What about movies like, like mo mo just talk movies with me for, I'd love, I grew up, my parents, Please, let's do it. Oh my God, my parents owned a chain of video stores growing up. And I, they owned all of them, and I would. I think I remember in one of our yeah. conversations you telling me about that. Yeah, they owned the movie stores, and so I grew up with movies, and I know all the actors, and we had sections for the actors. Not, I mean, everything. And Please tell me, what do you want to talk about? You know, what, let's talk about like Blazing Saddles and history. Oh. <laughs> let's go there. <laughs> My goodness, Blazing Saddles is one of the greatest films of all time. I and, and it's it's you know it's it's irreverence. It's so irreverent. Yeah. Another another great one along those lines that I, I might even have more vivid memories of, History of the World Part One. Yeah. How great is that film? Yeah. Space Ball. And you could go ahead, please. What, we, what else were you going to ask me? Like Space Ball in all of those movies. Space, Space Balls, I know probably less well than those others. I'm aware of the greatness of Space Balls, but for some reason, I, I, I didn't gravitate to that one as much. I, I know that it's a classic. I know that it has the following that, that probably Blazing Saddles and History of the World Part One have, but I don't, I don't know much about that film. John Candy, I know, is in that, and another guy that I really enjoyed from Parenthood. Uh, oh, what's his name? <laughs> I, I have to get his name because he needs to be acknowledged. He's wonderful. 
uh, not Martin Short, but he's in the same kind of category. Keep talking. I'll, I'll Google while we're talking here. Okay. Uh, he's wonderful. And he also a Canadian actor also, I think. Yeah, he's like John Candy. Why are we dressed? He's in Ghostbusters too, isn't he? Rick, Roman Rick Moranis. Rick Moranis, yes, a classic, a wonderful comedian, yeah. wonderful actor. Well, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, Mel Brooks is, I just, I love Mel Brooks. Slapstick is another great, great, over the top, fabulous comedy. Paul Newman, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. The Three Brothers. <laughs> oh my goodness, they were so great. <laughs> Well, anyway. And the fact that they were they were they were so nice off the ice, and they were goons on the ice. They were these terrifically tough and ready to go warriors on the ice, and off the ice they were these delightful guys playing with matchbox cars in their hotel room or <laughs> or toy <laughs> or some kind of toys. I don't know if it was matchbox cars or something else. Oh, another great Canadian film. Or, or, or at least one that features Canadian actors, Strange Brew. Oh, I love that. I think that is a Canadian film, though. I think the actors are Canadian, and the film production was Canadian, too. I need to make sure all my kids have seen Strange Brew. You know, I, I, we're going down the list of things you need to make sure your kids have seen. Please do that. These films need to be seen by by all generations. So, tell okay, so the movies you've done, do you have... Uh, we talked about your favorite one. Talk about another one, just, just stories or something. Yeah, like and I, I would say that I, and I, 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 again, I don't consider anyone a favorite. I know. It's, it's, it's just that there, there's something about your first, especially when it's one that leads to the establishment of your career that will always have its special place in the pantheon of what you've done. Other highlights, though, were the bone collector being on a set that was that big a movie that that, that was that big and yeah. then making a foray into television more substantially with person of interest i i had been on tv before though i don't think the audience had been as big as it was with person of interest as it had before, I'd, I'd recurred on on television before, though certainly being on a J.J. A Abrams show and playing a character that was interfacing with other actors that were as as Titanic as as they were on that show, just marvelous. And I'm very grateful for all of it. And I'm looking forward to more going forward. Yeah, I hope I hope so, too, because you're one of my favorite actors. So thank you. And, and not that that means anything in a, in a grand scale, but I mean, I think everybody loves you, loves you so much. And well, I thank you. And I, I am going to make a promise to you, Elizabeth, that you can look forward to seeing this screen, this, this face on screen, large or small going forward. That's my promise to you and anyone else who wants to see that happen. Yeah. I, I, I guarantee you, you're going to be, see some more dynamic and powerful things coming forward. Good. Yeah, and, and we make it happen too for you by watching you and supporting you and everything. So I, I, I appreciate every viewer, yeah. every single viewer. I'm grateful for. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. I love that you're great with your fans and everything too. It's I, I watch you and and you're something to be um, studied in that regard because you're very gracious with everybody. And I'm sure people, you know, people are people. They're always like, hey, I know him or hey, you know, they they write stuff and you're very gracious with everyone. You know, I want to I want to go. I'm going to keep going here. Uh, just for time's sake, we'll probably give 10 more minutes, maybe. So yeah, can... please. I, I have as much time, actually, as we want to devote to this today. Okay, cool. Um, talk Geico for me. <laughs> sure. <laughs> because you, you did those commercials, and they're they're funny. I mean, they're flat out. when they. Speaking I... of divine blessings, as I was attributing that definition to the Brothers McMullen, the Geico campaign, I, I feel, was another divine blessing in my life because there were things about it that were unavoidably kismetic. I had been relatively closed to on-camera commercials for some time. I was doing well in voiceover yeah. work and had been for many years. And there was something about the on-camera world that just didn't feel as appealing to me. And 
one of the agents I was working with at the time had written me about this campaign specifically and said, I know that you generally don't like to look at these things, though this is special and it's a campaign. And I think you'd be very right for this. I'm paraphrasing, but basically that's a, a pretty good expression of the message that I received from her. And I, I did look at it. And when I looked at it, I almost immediately, if not immediately, knew how special it was and how I was going to deliver the lines because it was written so well. Those spots were written so well, at least in my opinion, that there was only one way that it could be delivered. I looked at it and I thought, this guy is a hard boiled, super serious, over the top quasi 1940s, 1950s personality. And this is how this spot needs to be. This is what this spot calls for. And I had that character in my bag of tricks and would leave voicemail messages for friends of mine in this character that I had developed because I love this guy who talks like this and says to friends on voice messages that you are standing at the threshold of the Port Authority bus terminal men's room. So things like this, just absurd over the top messages for my friends, just to laugh and have fun and enjoy myself and make them laugh. And then it becomes the fundamental character that I inform the Geico campaign with. And it turns out to be this fabulous gift. Yeah. yeah. Do people come up to you and go, hey, the Geico guy? <laughs> yeah, there, there have been those sightings. And also electronically, sometimes a video will pop up or I'll upload a video on YouTube and there'll be a comment, the Geico guy or something like this. So, yes, there's been recognition of that, too. And I'm, I'm grateful for it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't know. I, I know a lot of people know this about you, but we're going to just act like people don't know this about you. For, for okay. You sing, you, you're musically inclined and it's Thank so you. cool. So you're like so multifaceted. What you remind me of, you know, like an, like an old Hollywood where everybody could sing and dance. And <laughs> Thank you. What a, I take that as a high compliment. Oh, yeah. I love, that's a magical time in our history. Oh, I, you know, the, the tap, I don't know if you can tap that. Gene I Kelly that. is a great yeah. example of what you're talking about. Yeah. I can, I can tap dance myself. Like I used to look at the movies and go, well, I need to know how to tap dance for sure. So I've tap danced since. How I marvelous. Dance. What a wonderful ability to have. But you know, that type of thing, those, the guys that can sing, dance, do whatever, you know, they're, they're just so um, elegant and graceful. And yeah, they, 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 they used to call them a song and dance man. Is that what Gene Kelly was called that. And he called himself that. Yeah. Do you see yourself like that? I, I do because I have done all those things, not yet professionally, though before I became a professional actor and performer, I was in musicals growing up, etc. And it hasn't developed that that has been expressed professionally for me yet on stage, only in workshops. It has happened in workshops before, though, or at least in one workshop though I look forward to any opportunities to express all of my abilities. And a musical is so much fun to be in. And I welcome anyone who's interested in exploring my music too, to search Michael McLone music if you want to know more, because there's a lot of it out there that I've released. And you can also go to my site, michaelmcglone.com, and there's a, there's a page devoted to my music there. Yep. And yes, I, I would look forward to integrating everything that I do in one project yeah awesome and your your ep is the center which is i'm going to read just read here um hero to be down speed and then there's other there's other singles and then there, there are many singles that i've released too the most recent album is the extended play the center and a very special record that is in expression very directly of the philosophy you and I were talking about earlier in terms of loving oneself and loving other people and what it is to do both of those things. 
Do you write all that too? Do you write it, write mm -hmm. everything, huh? Yes. And then I'll bring my songs to these fabulous musicians like John Cobert and Peter Kahlo and also my engineer and co-producer, Dominic Barbera, who is a musician too, not professionally, but to be the level of co-producer and engineer that he is, you have to have a musical proficiency. And he does. And he's a brilliant co-producer and a dear friend. And Peter Kahlo, John Cobert, Dominic Barbera, Shane Galas, Mike Lyons, Carl Morelli, Michael Gavigan. These are the men who come to me after I have a song and deliver such extraordinary amplifications of the music and its greatness because they bring their greatness to it and they add their particular genius for the interpretation of the music and it's fabulous. I love them all and they're fabulous musicians. Yeah, I, I love that about you. Um, do you, okay, now this is complicated though. Do, do you like music better than acting or do they go together or sometimes one takes For me, it's not complicated. Thank you for your thoughtfulness of that. Though it's, it's, a, it's a relatively simple answer for me because I don't have a preference. Okay, good. I would say that like, do I do- I do them. What's that? Do you have like a wish, like you wish something would happen with your music or something? Do you have do you have like dreams and goals and things like that secretly? <laughs> I definitely have goals, and i I want the I want the greater awareness of everything that I do. Yeah, I, I want the greater awareness of me as a screenwriter. I want the greater awareness of me as a television scriptwriter. I want the greater awareness of me as a television actor, as a film actor, as a singer, as a songwriter, as a producer, all of it. I want it all. And I am going after it all. There aren't things that I can share specifically about that now because I feel that anything that's in progress, you don't want to speak about when it's still in progress and it's pre-contractual, though the goals that I have are about every aspect of my creative life and achieving dynamic and powerful and large awareness results of them all. Good. Yeah. Do you... Okay, so um, I have notes on you, and the word Eddie Burns is used, and I call him Ed Burns. <laughs> sure, and, and he, he, he's called both. It, um, talk about him and his role in your life, and uh, he's a friend, correct? Yes, he is. We were speaking uh, just the other day, and he has a, a, a wonderful show on epics, which I welcome people to explore, called Bridge and Tunnel, and it's going to be airing its second season in July. They had a, a obviously successful first season because it was renewed for a second season. It will be airing in July. And I don't believe this is state secrets. They've renewed it for a third season and he's at work on that now. He is the most remarkable collaborator in my history. And I say that because we made my first film together and it was it was not technically his first film because he did make a film that didn't see the light of day before that but it, it was his first professionally recognized film so to some extent it, it it does have authenticity that it was his first film professionally and then we we moved on to make another film that he he wrote a character for me in yeah. And that was almost the polar opposite, if not the polar opposite of what I played in the first film. So he writes this fabulous character in the first film before we had even met that I play and I am recognized for very substantially. And then he writes this other character for me, which is the opposite of that guy. So it shows a range for me that's so dynamic and powerful and wonderful, which is a great gift from him. Oh, yeah. And then we made a, a, a third film together called The Fitzgerald Family Christmas, which I welcome everyone to see. If you're a fan of Michael McGlone, Eddie Burns films, you have to see this movie. 
if you're not and you're just a fan of good, wholesome, strong comedies and, and family dramas, because it's both, then see it because it's a heartfelt, well-written, dynamic and wonderful piece. Yeah, I love those movies. That's that's how that's how I know you. Then I fa I found you on I, I think I, I can't even remember how we met. I think I found you on Facebook and asked you to be on the cover of my magazine. Is that right? Ah, it's possible because I know that 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 both of those things happened. Yes. Yeah, I think that and and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's really him, and he's so kind and gracious, and you don't have to be, and you are, and, and you oh well, smile, and you're you're just you. What I love about you too is. When you get an email from Michael McGlone, it is addressed properly. Mm. It is addressed properly, always. Like I'll, I'll I kind of get sloppy in my email. Sometimes I'm like, oh, it's Michael. I got to respond. You not, not got to respond perfectly too. And I'm like, no, you know me. But you're uh, absolutely and I, I and well worded, well worded and beautiful. Yes, I and I, I, I don't, I don't put my standards on others. No, you don't. However, they come to me. If it's if it's polite and and respectful, where I'm in. I, however, you want to express yourself in a positive way. I want to reflect on when you said before you're so gracious and you don't have to be. And I know how you say that, and I receive that as a compliment. I want to amplify my answer to that and my, i also let you know what my interior response to that was when i heard that it was that I, I i feel i do have to be because i want the best life that i can have which i know you're devoted to as well because your your model is the best ever you that's your that's your platform what? and for me to have the best life possible is to have the most dignified, respectful, and loving experience with other people. And for me, that does include please and thank you and forgive me if ever necessary, though sometimes I've struggled with that one. And in, in the past, you know, I'd have to, I, I would have to reflect on the fact that, wow, you're having a real time, real hard time here inviting the idea that maybe you need to ask for forgiveness for this. And all of these meditations are about how can you be the best possible instrument of love? So when you say you don't have to be, I want to benevolently submit that I do Good. because it's what gives me the satisfaction of knowing you have put what's necessary into this communication to make it as good as you can make it. Yeah, I, I personally think there's there's nothing worse than meeting someone such as yourself, for example, you know, like so, an actor that you want to meet or whatever, and then mm -hmm. disappointed in the way they've treated you. There's right. nothing more like a letdown, like of somebody that you're um, like idolizing or th watching their movies or reading their books or whatever it is. And then you get near them and they're like unkind or they don't have time or they do whatever that is. That's like, yeah. And, and I totally, I totally understand because you know, you get, you get to a scale too where you're busy or there's a layer too between you and the public or whatever it is. But um, I, I'm trying to say that I appreciate you always. I mean, really, truly always. Um, Thank I, you. I, I, you I, I, and you were like, you were very, very kind. Like, Thank you so much. And forgive me. I, I, if I stepped on you before no. I, I think perhaps when people meet a celebrity that they have admired and do admire and they're treated less than well, it might be amplified as, as a negative experience because they brought so much positive emotion to it. Yeah. So that's correlative to the negative emotion that they feel because they want it to be such a happy yeah. thing because they're so happy to see this person. And that's what I've reflected on before, that when people come up to me and I recognize that they're acknowledging me as this really important person to them, I feel honored and I feel that I want to be as honorable about how they feel about me as I can because without that feeling that they have for me, 
this would not be as positive as, for, for me yeah. as it is. The fact that they love me and they haven't even met me is an honor and it's beautiful. And I won't say that I've always been completely graceful. There were times before I got sober and other times when I felt impinged and I potentially was not as polite or embracing as I am now that I'm not saying that I've always conducted myself and alcohol. So I'm not blaming it on alcohol. My choice was to drink and to be uh, sure. that way, though. I will say that after I got sober and, and, and made commitments that were along the lines of, of love that were connected to that sobriety, uh, I don't know that it happened as regularly. Yeah. And I, I think it's become very rare though upon reflection too, there are times when everyone needs a certain amount of forgiveness. So the fact that there are celebrities there who maybe have been rude to someone, though it's not maybe their model of, of conduct, it's just they're having a day where they got interfered with or their wife just yelled at them or their husband just left them or who knows what's going on in their, in their lives. And it's not necessarily that they're just being ungrateful to that person, but there's something going on that has afflicted them and made them less than what they're capable of being in that type of transaction. So forgiveness is important for all of us to remember, though, if there's a if there's a track record of people just being rude, then that's also something that needs to be called out and that needs to be yeah. acknowledged, too. Yeah, you, you bring up a great point, and, and it's one of the things I, I say a lot and remind people of, and it's to be really super kind to every human being that you come, encounter with, and encounter them with a sense of, a sense of grace, um, elegance, compassion, collaboration, and so forth, because you really, truly have absolutely no idea what's going on in somebody's life unless you cry a little bit. I mean, like, you really have no idea. And, and, and even in passing, sometimes I just, I really like to slow mm -hmm. down um, probably for about 10 years now, I've had this in place where I've just slowed down to, to just embrace other people around me more. Um, and it, when you, when you pause and other people are still kind of going, <laughs> you mm -hmm. can, you can feel the difference. Um, but Indeed. I, yeah. And I would say that in my life, compassion and, and love has always when 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 fully expressed yeah. been a, a beautiful experience not always without pain but beautiful and profound and terrific i will say also though that one's compassion for another person can also be translated into instruction as well mm -hmm. like when someone is being unkind to someone else and i'm in the company of this interaction. There have been times when I've intervened and on the surface, people could think that, oh, he's experiencing, he's expressing himself more forcefully in this, though that's kindness too. And that's love too. I, cause there was a time in my life when I thought it has to always be passivity. It has to always be pacification. And for me, I, I had a breakthrough when I realized Actually, that's not strictly true. If there is someone being abused by someone else or there's an abusive circumstance or a polarly negative circumstance and either physical force or a more instructive verbal response to someone is called for, that also is love. So that is something that I, I use to balance how... I conduct myself. If peace is possible, always choose peace. Yeah, I agree. Sometimes, sometimes it, 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 re it requires a more active, what's going on right now in Ukraine is a good example of this. Yeah. Someone steps into someone else's country with a gun and a rapacious attitude and you've got to stand up and you've got to fight. There are times that that's the appropriate response too. Though, of course, this is all to be weighed moment to moment and occasion to occasion. Okay, I'm gonna ask this. Um, so I, I'm, I wanna go back to drinking for a little bit. 
Sure, and please. I want to hang out there because I think a lot of people really um, struggle with alcohol and substances and so forth. And I'm a person who as I have had a lifelong non, no relationship with alcohol whatsoever. No drugs, no alcohol. No Bless drugs. that. Yeah, it, it, it's not been very easy. I actually got pretty bullied and made fun of and it, I didn't fit in right and all these. You got things. bullied for not drinking? See, that's, that's, yeah. that's a great example yeah. of the toxicity of addiction. Yeah. Because people who are probably experiencing negative results with alcohol want you to join them. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I mean, I've really been picked on for not drinking. Um, and so what's not here. You won't be, you're celebrated here <laughs> to whatever degree that can help with the healing that, that you wanted to do around that, that bullying. It's, it's I, I suggest. It's yeah. so, it can be so hard for me to find friends. Because and and I respect people who drink or whatever, but you know, it just it's just tricky sometimes. Uh, but anyway, um, what what was your moment where you were like, okay, enough with this? Like really? Well, I had a lot of moments. Yeah. I had a lot of moments with drinking. I had there there have been three different sororities for me. This is the one that has lasted because this is the one that's invested with humility, with love, with a collaboration that I'm not doing it alone. In the past, I had a very, I call it Irish response to getting sober, though, of course, the Irish don't corner the market on pride. But this was something that I associated certainly with my Irish background that, you know, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you're going to do it on your own. And it's it's to a, to a certain extent ego based. You're going to be tough and you're going to be sober and all of this. But when I finally had success the third time, third time being a charm with my sobriety, it wasn't about that kind of ego-based toughness. It was about another kind of toughness. It was a toughness of love. It was, are you going to be tough enough to open your heart to love? Are you going to be tough enough to say you need help? Are you going to be tough enough to say that you're not going to do it alone, that you don't want to do it alone? Are you going to be that tough? Yeah. And... My mom has been a great influence throughout my life. She is 49, 48 or 49 years sober. And she has been just by example, silent example of, of, of sobriety, a great example of that. And then she was also a vocal example of it too. One time she wrote me a letter when I was particularly abusive with myself that was instructing me to be sober and that she was praying for me, praying for this, et cetera. I'm paraphrasing, but you know, you're a mom, you know what would be in that letter. And I remember that I read the letter and I couldn't take action. It wasn't actionable for me because as I said to a friend on the phone the other day, I, I could only be sober when I could be sober. And that wasn't at that moment. I could not be sober at that moment. I could be sober at, at other moments. And then I went back to drinking and I could only finally be most successfully sober. As I say, when I surrendered to the, the equation of collaboration that informed the sobriety for me, because being sober for me was only the first step or only one step that needed to be taken toward being my full capacious self. It wasn't drinking wasn't even the problem. Drinking was a symptom of the problem. The problem was I didn't want to look at myself. I didn't want to have the best life I could have. I didn't want to put the work in. I wanted the easy way out. I wanted that anesthetization. I wanted that numbness. I wanted that thing that was going to hold me back. And once I got drinking out of the way, I had to realize, well, the drinking wasn't holding you back. You were holding you back and you still want to hold you back. Why? And the only way that I felt I was going to have the best chance of answering that question was with drinking out of the way and with cigarettes out of the way. I also quit smoking, which from a physical addiction standpoint was more difficult than alcohol. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So coming on 20 years sober, coming on 10 years smoke free mm -hmm. and still meditating on a regular basis about how I can get any type of darkness in me that wants to impede my progress equalized and integrated. I don't say canceled because there's no way to cancel what's inherent and it's inherent in me 
to be the killer on CBS's SWAT. It's inherent in me to be that nasty person who wants the destruction of himself and others. And I don't say that in a dark way. I say that as an artist. Yeah. Those things live in me. As an instrument of love, it's my duty to equalize all of those capacities so that I live in harmony. And they only have an expression in my artistic life. They don't have one in my personal life. That's really well put. Thank you. That's that's that. I hope everybody replays that and listens to it if you. <laughs> they can transcribe it if they think it's valuable enough. It's unique, you know. Like I, I always say, um, you know, sometimes when people perceive difficulties with them, they're really gifts in a way. Mm -hmm. they're, they're always they're gifts. gifts. They're always gifts. I, I, people get so down on themselves, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Positive it's attitude. Great. If you stay with a positive attitude long enough, you'll get the answer. It may not be immediate. But if you stay with that positive attitude, the answer will come. Yeah. That's, that's been my experience. There's not one time I have, I have implemented a positive attitude about anything going on in my life, and it's failed to illustrate how that is the best response. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay, so well, I've kept you here almost an hour. I'm <laughs> sorry. I said 30 minutes. And There's we're going nothing to, to apologize for, Elizabeth. Please, I have loved this, and I, I, I'm so happy we did it today. This has been such a nourishing event. Yeah, yeah, I love chatting with you. So thank you. Thank you for your time and everything. You're so welcome. I want to ask you one more thing. Okay, so in Please. all the things we talked about, is there anything that I like haven't asked you that I should be asked, like something I overlooked or something you want to talk about or... Um, is there anything that you, you want to worry? You, I, you know, the, the answer to that is no. I think that what you've asked is perfect. I would like to, I would like to conclude with this, if I could, though, and that is that I welcome everyone who's watching this to know that they are an instrument of love and greatness and anything in them in their thinking or their feeling that tells them different is a dark lie. The truth is that we are all comprising of the ultimate truth of love. And it is just a matter of stripping away the distractions and the illusions from this. And I want everyone to know that I believe in them and I want the best for them now and always. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's well, Self-love, self-worth, self-value, all those great words. that we Yes, and it will only result in loving others more substantially because if you are loving yourself in the most profound and, 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 and humble way, it naturally is expressed to other people. Yeah, we have one of the best free, we have one of the best free resources on besteveryou.com ever in the whole country. Um, her name is Dr. Margaret Paul. Um, she does inner bonding and she pioneered the term self-love and self-worth. She pioneered I mean, years. She's 84. I went, oh, Margaret. I wow. Know. She's the first known person to use these terms. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. She's in, in, in everything. And she, wow. she's one of my dear friends. Um, she writes for best ever you. She's, she's over age. She's in her mid eighties. She does her uh, podcast. We're about to uh, uh, launch her course. Not to, you know, anyway, hi, Dr. Margaret. <laughs> yes. Oh, no, please plug that. That's important. Yeah, yeah she's so cool. Um, so, and the you, fact that you have that, have, have such a titanically important and intelligent person as a free resource is magnificent of both of you. Yeah, she's she does a lot of blogs and everything for Best Ever You. So we, we have her. She's one of our thought leaders. And Congratulations on that collaboration. And I express my thanks to her as well because I know she's improving the world. Oh, yeah. So, Michael, um, it has been awesome chatting with you. What's your Likewise. Where, where do, um, what's your website? And I'll, I'll make sure we... MichaelMcLone.com. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks so much for your time. You are so welcome. And thank you also. Your heart. I just, I love you. So Likewise. Thank you, sweetie. Hey, okay, everybody. Thanks for listening and watching. Take care.